All right, so we're out here in Antarctica filming with Atlas Ocean Voyages, and today we're gonna do a gear breakdown. Just kidding, we're in my apartment, and it's kind of hot because we're in Florida, but let's get into it. Yo, what's happening, everyone? So I just got back from Antarctica. We did a cruise with Atlas Ocean Voyages, and I got a ton of questions when I was out there about different gear I use, uh, different tips or tricks for shooting in Antarctica, whether it's photo or video and just other things to think about while you are out there filming in an extreme environment like Antarctica. <laughs> so a couple notes before we kind of get into everything. First off, the gear I brought on this campaign definitely was reflective of what we were trying to set out to accomplish. Our goal was to capture the ship. This was only its third trip down to Antarctica, so it's brand new. They don't have a ton of content yet. So we were capturing things around the ship, of the ship in these incredible locations. But then also we were using influencers to showcase different activities and adventures and the nature and the wildlife and how close you can get to all that. That 100% affected what we brought on this trip. If we were going out to do a strictly like nature documentary shoot, we would have probably adjusted and brought some different equipment that was a little bit more specialty for that. We went there in December. So that was Antarctica's summer. Within the span of 30 minutes, to the next 30 minutes, the conditions can be very different. It could be snowing, overcast, windy and terrible, and 30 minutes later, the sun is out. The weather patterns there are absolutely crazy, so you need to be kind of prepared for anything when you go out. Think about it. If on day one, you go out, wave comes over the front of the skiff, your camera gets doused and doesn't work the rest of the trip, what do you do? You can't go to a camera store in Antarctica. Maybe you can like find a whale and they'll go to a camera store in Argentina. It's like a two day trek by boat. I don't know how fast whales go. These are your only options out there. The other thing is some of the gear that I'm gonna talk about, you might look at and say, oh wow, I don't wanna spend $7,000 for a setup like that, which I totally understand. When I was doing only maybe one or two of these trips a year, I would actually rent a lot of this equipment. I use lensrentals.com. You can go on there, uh, a big lens like this, you know, for two weeks is only going to run you $250, $300 versus spending $1,800 to purchase it outright. And if you know that this is something that you do, you know, every couple months, maybe it makes sense to buy it. But if you're only doing this, you know, once in a lifetime trip, maybe you just want to rent the equipment to get those shots that you're looking for. With that being said, I'm going to jump into some of the gear. So first off, we have the A7S III. The main reason I wanted to bring this camera was it shoots 4K, 120 frames a second. I do a lot of you know wildlife reels or nature reels on Instagram. It fits perfectly into that nine by 16 format without losing any quality. The other benefit is shooting in 120 frames, but having those additional frames gives you a lot more to play with in post-production. So keep in mind when you're filming in Antarctica, you're either on a moving cruise ship you're either on a skiff that's moving and bouncing around in the waves, and especially they're inflatable. So if someone adjusts their weight on one side, you're bouncing to, uh, you're dealing with wind elements, you're dealing with snow. There's a lot of different elements. So the more data that you can capture within these shots, the more frames that you can shoot with, the more you can play around with it in post. You really only need to nail like a half a second shot in 120 frames to be able to drag that out to two seconds and have it be super smooth. So even if you're on a boat and you're shaking all around and all of a sudden you just get that half a second good shot in there, you can slow that down to a full two seconds to be able to use in your video. Um, and it helps tremendously. I also have a little cage on this. It helps with, you know, being on the go, you drop the camera on a rock or something, you're just protecting the body. It also comes with, uh, you know, a couple different like rig attachments. So if you need to rig your audio or lights or anything to it. The next camera that I brought was my A7 III. So this also shoots at 120 frames a second and 1080. In 4K, you can only shoot up to 30 frames. So this was pretty much my secondary camera. I was using the A7S III for as much as possible. And then I also had this one set up for other photos or videos when I needed it. The big thing to note is make sure you have fast SD cards in your camera. You might come across something absolutely insane that's happening and it's only happening for 15, 20 seconds and you're right there. The last thing you want is to be shooting on photo burst, shoot five, 10 photos, and then have to sit there for 30, 45 seconds, a minute, 
while those photos get downloaded to the card. You want cards that are as fast as possible so you can keep shooting and not miss the shot of a lifetime. I cannot stress that enough. I think I spent $300 on the two SD cards for the A7S III alone, and it's well worth it because you shoot faster, it downloads faster, it just makes everything that much better. And that brings me to the next thing, which is lenses. So I like bringing a variety of lenses for exactly the reason I just explained. You could be cruising, you could see a whale 100, 200 yards in the distance that you wanna get a shot of. And then next thing you know, a leopard seal pops up right next to you. If you are shooting on a 200 to 600 F.6 to 6.3 lens, it's gonna be really hard to get something that that's close. So if you're too close and you, you only have one camera with this lens on, you're gonna have to sit down, you're gonna have to switch lenses. Keep in mind you're in all your big bulky, you know, layers, you have life jackets on, it's not easy to move things around. You could be on a moving skiff, water's flying everywhere. So for me personally, I liked having the two different camera setups that I could have two lenses set up for the, the truck. It is heavy, that's the only downside to it. Like my body was really starting to hurt by like day five or six because with it locked into the camera and then you're on a skiff and you're trying to turn your body, you're trying to hold completely still while the skiff's moving and everyone's bouncing around. And, uh, you know, a couple days of hauling around, a, I don't know how much weight, five, 10 pound camera can get to you. The next lens that we were using right here, the Tamron 70 to 180. This is basically like the Sony G Master 70 to 200. The biggest difference is it's Tamron, it's lighter, and it's about $1,000 cheaper. So I opted to get this lens instead of the Sony because of all that. It's smaller, especially with all the travel we do. It fits in smaller spaces. It's less weight. It's still just as fast, just as quick. I have no complaints with it whatsoever. I highly recommend uh, the Tamron 70 to 180. It's a 2.8 lens as well. So it works well in lower light. The next lens that we brought was the Sigma 24 to 70 2.8. So this was actually my first time using this lens and I was pretty impressed with it. I mean, it's a little heavier, but that feels kind of good sometimes. You know, if your camera's too light, you can't really go handheld and, and film that way. This was very good for shooting around the boat. You know, on the boat, spaces are a lot closer. And then the last lens, which is the one that is actually on the A7S III, is the Sony 16 to 35 2.8 wide lens. So, this lens is awesome. Anything wide, filming on the boat, filming room tours on the boat. Um, it was also good for some of the stuff that we were doing on land, you know, where we're trying to showcase how close we are to the wildlife and get some incredible scenery shots. Like you need a, a good wide lens for good landscapes. So that came in a lot of handy. The only other camera that we brought really was the GoPro 360. This is great because you can use it as a GoPro or as a GoPro 360 we were not able to bring a drone on this trip. So I knew that there were certain perspectives that I really wanted to capture. And without being able to bring a drone based on IOTA rules and us not getting the proper permits ahead of time, it was a pretty last minute, uh, we got la notified last minute for this trip. I wanted to bring a 360 to be able to give some crazy perspective around the ice and us on the skiffs and ideally getting close to wildlife. I brought this guy here. It's also waterproof. So like on the skiff, once again, this is really good to use. Just make sure the lens doesn't get dirty because if it does, then all your footage is blurred. So I bring the GoPro 360 and then I have a kind of like a selfie pole. So you can get like these crazy shots from far out. You can have the 360 on the end of it and it actually records all, it films everything and it actually hides the pole at the end based on how the camera lenses are set up in the parallax. So you can bring one of these. Uh, if you can't bring a drone, they're good for skiffs. You look like an idiot, but at the end of the day, the content's pretty badass, so why not? The only thing I'm not talking about here and I didn't lay out on the table is this guy, my iPhone. So I am using my iPhone more and more on shoots. This is the iPhone 13 Pro. The iPhone is quick. It's easy to pull out of my pocket. I can just shoot some wide stuff real quick. We're in the drink passage. Oh. <laughs> 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 
camera on it's incredible. The cinematic mode's incredible. The other tripod we brought, this is actually a monopod here. So this was really good because I could just tuck it into the side of my backpack when we did land excursions. It's easy to keep on the skiff off to the side. If I ever needed to just pop a lens in it, you know, I could just boop, pop it in, be ready to go. So this was very helpful, especially with the other, the 200 to 600 lens, because that thing is hard to keep stable. This helped tremendously. It's still probably like if you want to film a full on wildlife documentary, you're going to want something a little more heavy duty, but this worked out really well. If we wanted to get really serious, this is the tripod that we bought. It's a Schlatt, 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 I don't know. I bought it on Craigslist, so I don't really know the details of it, but it's way more heavy duty. Um, it was really good for filming on the boat because you can just set it up wherever, no issues. It was a little bit harder for land excursions, you know, for me to carry this plus the backpack, plus all our heavy, you know, overcoats and parkas and everything or life jackets on, and then another Pelican case, it was a lot. So I didn't bring this really onto many land excursions. I used the monopod instead, but it was very helpful to have on the ship. Just keep in mind, if you are bringing something like this, that's an additional check bag usually. Um, so you just kind of have to weigh the value that it's going to bring you based on what you're trying to get out of it. If you're trying to really focus on just super cinematic penguin footage and that's your only goal is filming penguins in video, I would bring this and just make it a point to just set up shop, sit there and get some ridiculous shots. If you're trying to do more photo work, I don't think you need this at all. I would go with something like a monopod and just be sure to keep your shutter speed higher so that if you do move or the wind blows or whatever, your images are still coming out crisp. The couple other things that we brought, one was audio equipment, shotgun mic, and then we have the Rode um, wireless lav pack kits. So if we did any interviews on board, we could just mic people up, no problem. Uh, the shotgun mic was super helpful if we didn't need to mic anyone up. Extra batteries are of course essential. You know, you don't want to be out there. Your battery's dead. It gets too cold. Something like that happens and then your camera doesn't work. So always bring an extra battery or two for sure. I also brought ND filters and UV filters for all of the cameras. If we were just mainly focused on video, you know, we would put the ND on the cameras and do it that way. But I recommend using um, NDs or UVs, especially if you get a sunny day. And you're... All right. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about were just some other little things that are great to have. So one, we have these kind of disposable cleaning wipes for the camera lens. So if you do get any salt water or anything on there, you know, we have our microfiber cloths, but it doesn't always come off as easy. So it's good to just have some alcohol pads as well that you can clean the lens um, and make sure that everything's good to go. I also use these things. So these are just like the gel packets that you get when you buy a new piece of equipment or something like that. And they absorb all the moisture. I keep these in my backpack and in my Pelican case. So if some snow does get in there or you put a wet camera in or anything like that, it just helps absorb that moisture. Also, you can recharge these by putting them in the oven and kind of drying them out again. And then lastly is depending on your ship, make sure you have an adapter. At the end of the day, you're gonna have to charge gear. So other than that, the only two other things that we brought were these Pelican cases. So I brought my main travel Pelican case. This is super convenient because it fits in the uh, above the seats on a plane so you can actually carry it on. And then I would just build out my cameras in there. And then I brought this smaller one in case we did any kayaking or paddle boarding and I knew I just needed to bring one camera. I basically just have the foam cut out on the inside for the camera. So I can just drop the camera body in there and close it down. I can take it out. And if I need to get those better shots, I have the option to um, versus just filming on a GoPro. Like you, you still wanna get that good quality and I didn't wanna just film from a, a skiff or something. I want to be out there doing these activities. So both of those were very good to have. Last section of this video, we're almost done. Stick with me is a couple tips, tricks, and just advice for filming out there. So once again, keep in mind, you're on a moving ship. It's rocking in the waves. There's wind. There's all these other elements. If you're shooting photos, make sure you keep your shutter speed high. Secondly, I'm always looking for subjects that can give whatever it is what we're trying to capture better perspective. 
So that could be a person, be a skiff. It could be the cruise. It could be penguins. I'm always just trying to give something that when someone sees it, so if they see a skiff with people in front of these giant icebergs, they have a true perception of how giant these icebergs actually are. And this is what happens a lot of time is people will just shoot these mountains and be like, wow, these mountains are incredible. I can't wait for people to see these photos. And then when you look at the photo back, it doesn't look that spectacular. It's because there's no perception of how big those mountains actually are. If possible, Bringing two cameras with different setups is awesome. So I could take my Pelican case out. I could have one wide lens, one zoom lens on, and then I can just swap cameras instead of needing to be like, okay, hold on, let me take my gloves off. Let me take this lens off. Now snow gets in on the sensor or something. Now you're sitting there trying to clean your sensor. It just makes life a lot easier if you're able to have two setups. Um, what I've also done in the past when I didn't have multiple Sony cameras is I would just rent one. The last thing, you know, make sure you have protection for your gear. These Pelican cases are great. If you don't have one of these, nor you want to spend money on one, what you can do is actually get dry bags off Amazon. They're like 10, 15 bucks. And these are great to just even tuck, tuck the camera in. You can put some towels in there. The last tip I have is when we went pretty much was 24 hour daylight. So as soon as the sun would set, it would actually rise again. Pay attention to the light and when you could possibly get the best light. It was 10, 30, 11 at night sometimes when the sun was going down. Sometimes at two in the three in the morning when the sun was coming up, it was absolutely spectacular. You do not know when the light's gonna peek through certain days. Be ready for it. The shots you can capture when there's actually light and creating shadows and you can see depth in these mountains between the ridges and the icebergs and all this just makes it that much more magical. So when the light comes out, Shoot and keep shooting. Even if you think you've already have 10,000 photos of icebergs, make sure you do when the light comes out. So I hope this video was super helpful for those of you that need it. You know, definitely drop a comment below if you have any questions about the trip or other gear that I brought or want me to break down anything further. I'm happy to do so. If not, I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.